conscious that we're running late, so I'll just jump in straight away to introduce. On my far left is uh, Tim Patterson. Uh, Tim, as you heard earlier, is Vice President and Director of Programming at Nickelodeon UK. He's responsible for program acquisition, development, content strategy, planning and scheduling, media planning and operations for Nickelodeon's portfolio of channels, including on-demand and multi-platform. So he's a busy man with uh, over 30 years experience in the industry, including stints at UK TV, Carlton Television, the Disney Channel, and uh, as he said, the BBC. And uh, um, panelists always send me their uh, bio, so I like to check on Google if uh, they're telling the truth. <laughs> And uh, he is telling the truth, but I also discovered that Tim is the second most famous Tim Patterson on a Google search. <laughs> uh, Tim Patterson also invented MS-DOS, so the operating system, so he's the most famous one. But runner up, runner up. Um, in the middle here is uh, Pauline McNamara from RTE. She's the commissioning executive in uh, Young People's Programs. Uh, and she, her responsibility is for commissioning live action programming from the independent sector and uh, animation, uh, managing RTE's animation slate. Before RTE, um, which she joined in 2005, I believe, Pauline was a producer in the independent sector for 15 years, and her resume includes a stint on Ireland's noisiest export, Riverdance. Um, Pauline is number five on Google. The <laughs> There's a matron called the Pauline McNamara who's bigger than me. Well, there's four, four solicitors called Pauline McNamara, which <laughs> I suspect may be, uh, may be the same person. Um, and here beside me, uh, an old friend of mine in the business, Sarah Muller. Um, Sarah is head of CBBC Acquisitions, Animation and Drama Development. With a slate that covers both live action and animation, Sarah's recent animation commissions include Strange Hill High, Stream Street, and she is exec producing an upcoming reboot of the classic Danger Mouse, which uh, I'd like to talk to her a little bit about later. Um, Sarah was previously managing director of Elephant Productions, so she also has come from the independent sector over to broadcasting. And Sarah, you're the most famous Sarah Muller on a Google search, so. Not after the East well German done. swimmer. <laughs> So, uh, with the introductions over, I'd just like to, to I I if you wouldn't mind, just each of you taking us through um, the overall mandate for the channel or channels that you look after, and, and basically talking about that strategy. And if we could start with uh, with Tim. Yeah, I mean, for those um, who listened to me talk earlier, I, I talked extensively really about the breadth. But for those who weren't, I look after four channels. Two of them are a preschool. One is focused solely on animation, which is Nicktoons, and the other is more live action focused, which is Nickelodeon. We call it Big Nick internally. The, the fact that we have so many hours um, to fill um, means that we, and we have very strong competition. So being commercial, we need to one, compete well within, uh, not only within our sphere of kids, but now with, with Netflix and with Amazon doing their thing, the, the pond of linear TV is shrinking. The opportunity to view outside of that is growing. So it means that the content that we acquire has to be better than ever. We're very lucky. We have a very strong pipeline coming down from our, our, uh, our, big, our big brother in the States, our, 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 mother, our mothership. So Nickelodeon being an American channel, we have most of our live action fed from Nickelodeon US. We have a lot of our animation fed down from the US, and it's the preschool arena that I showed earlier that really is the fertile ground for commissioning and for localization. In terms of what we're looking for, I was talking to someone earlier about this. At the, at the moment, it, it was, there's a, there's a mantra, it was heart, fart, and smart. Okay, that was the, the essence of where we were. I think that still holds true to a degree, but I think the, the mantra of funny, 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 as in with only permission if it's funny, I think that will move into more a realm of, of being far more open to, let's say, a bit of murder, not murder. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say murder mystery, but that's taking it to another level. Um, 
but certainly mystery, maybe a bit spooky. I was talking to some one of you guys earlier about, you know, with, with this gentleman here, about, you know, is Nick into horror? And I said, well, to a degree, probably. And that's going to be quite an interesting development. I would love to bring back a, a goosebumps, are you afraid of the dark type thing, because everyone loves being spooked a bit, especially kids. And I think there is the, you know, we can have some great fun there. So we're looking for great ideas. It's a very, very broad thing to say, but generally that's what we want. Um, great ideas can come from anywhere. The secret is trying to sort of find me or my colleagues to actually impart that and don't ever give up. Um, but yes, yeah, so in a nutshell, half of stuff, at least half of the, uh, the content comes from, our, from America via Nickelodeon, and they are quite prolific at the moment in terms of what they're doing. And the rest hopefully from people local and local that I can then take internationally, as I've done with a couple of brands that I showed earlier. So, thanks, Tim. Um, so going uh, sort of to the opposite side of Tim's, in the, very much in the commercial space, Sarah, you're in the public broadcasting space, and, and maybe you could take us through uh, what you're looking for and how it works. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick overview because I think it makes sense of what CBBC is. We are the older of the two children's channels at BBC and we serve children aged 6 to 12. Theoretically, maybe now children 6 to 14 as we try to move into the space that was left vacant by Switch a few years back. The terrible news for this particular audience is that we're a microcosm of the rest of the BBC. So if you can find it in adult space, you're going to find it on CBBC as well. So we have a lot of live action drama, we have news, we have sport, we have a lot of really quite brave uh, documentary strands and that means that the potential for animation, the slots available for animation are very much squeezed and that tends to be limited to one hour a day which is at tea time as kids get home and that's four 11 minute series and then one or two narrative series like Strange Hill High and Dragon's Riders of Burke that sit in half an hour but feel more like storytelling and can therefore sit alongside the rest of the slate. So there aren't as many opportunities as some of my colleagues have, and I'm always a little bit jealous. Having said that, if anyone's going to take a risk, it's public service. Mm -hmm. So if you've got something that feels a bit different, a bit strange, in fact, talking of strange, I can't think of another broadcast that would probably have managed to get Strange Hill High through because it wasn't like anything else, quite deliberately, then, then we're the people to do that. Uh, we are also, for the most part, looking for laugh out loud funny. We very much like character-driven, and character's not a word I've heard here much today. I've heard a lot about story, but less about character. And I think when you're building the world from scratch, as we do in animation, you've really got to think about who the characters are that you are creating, what they're like, what they do and don't want, and how they'll resonate with the audience. And I think Tim could probably tell you that for all the wonderfulness of Spongebob they spent a really long time working on those characters before they really got going and it's part of how well those relationships work that make that show such a long standing success so we're definitely looking for character I think more than anything we will expect scripts which we will look at to be funny off the page uh, and then I'm just thinking what we might say that might mix it up a bit. I think I might quite like to see, because I think we're going more episodic as Netflix and Amazon come into a space where children can make choices about the type of stories that they're watching. I think the space might be there now for an episodic animation. And Alan could probably even tell you a little bit about something called Detention Air, which they had at Teleteen, which I couldn't persuade anyone to buy because it was so radical which I thought was incredible. So I think we need to start kicking over a few stones and maybe thinking about different ways of doing things. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I, I certainly don't want to become sort of uh, part of the panel, but, uh, you know, I think it, 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 it is worth talking uh, about formats. And sometimes it's the formats that are, are, are hard to sell. Detention Air was an episodic, i.e. there's a cliffhanger at the end of every episode and most of, most executives and my bosses included would say, well, it doesn't work, it's not repeatable. And, and there, the evidence supported that when we screened it, but we, what we found was that the first screening got tremendous interest and it created tremendous interest online as well and the catch-up video play which is becoming increasingly important for broadcasters so that was an example where a, a risk can work but mm. uh, I, I don't want to step over no. over your piece here 
Are, are you? Uh, that will do me for the moment. Okay, thank good. you. Um, and so just bringing it back closer to Ireland, Pauline. Um, I, just before getting into what, what, uh, what we do and what we're looking for, I just want to make the point to the young women in the room that there are a lot of strong female producers who were not here today and a number of projects that we have in development and in production at the moment are being led by female producers. It was a very impressive lineup of, of uh, Irish producers, but it was very male. So I just wanted to make that point to the girls in the room. Um, I uh, work at RTE, as Alan said. I am commissioning executive across um, all of the young people's output put uh, from 0 to 18 year olds. Uh, my brief includes animation and live action commissioning. And our content is, goes out on RTE Junior and on RTE 2 and the children's block on RTE 2, which is the second channel. So, um, to uh, just explain about RT Junior, uh, because this is animation, our priority on, on RT Junior would be animation. RT Junior is a dedicated preschool channel. It is uh, coming up to its second birthday. Um, it is uh, the third channel in the RT suite of, of channels. Uh, we broadcast 12 hours a day for under sevens, uh, seven days a week. We also have RT Junior radio channel and uh, an RT Junior app and a website which is updated daily and contains a lot of the content. So uh, within the RT Junior under sevens content, the 61% um, of what we put out for 12 hours a day is acquired programming uh, through necessity and, um, and monies. So we buy a lot of content from uh, my colleagues here and, uh, and, and a lot of the big brands that children really want to watch, but 39% of the programming that we put out on the channel is home produced. It's produced in Ireland by Irish people for our children, and we would see that as our key way to actually stand out in a really busy um, landscape. I mean, all of our audience have access to all of their channels, and you know they have all of the big brands. We also have all of those brands, but what we can offer to an Irish audience is their own voices. We can, let the, we can reflect their own, own world back at them, and we can tell Irish stories with Irish heroes and Irish voices. So very much what we look to do with our commissioning and our, um, our animation spend is to localise the schedule, to actually make it feel like an Irish channel that belongs to Irish children and that they can participate in. So, you know, through our live action programmes, you know, the children get to take part in shows. Through the animations that the guys produce, they get to, to act in them. They, they're used for voices in it. So they're, they hear their own world reflected back at them. And we see that as what the unique thing that we can offer but also part of our um, responsibility as a public service broadcaster. The second thing that we would see as, as our, our unique thing, it's not the unique because it's yours too, but uh, is that we are completely commercial free. So whereas RTE as the state broadcaster, the public service broadcaster is dual funded through license fee and commercials, or uh, children's output has been ring fenced and it's completely commercial free. So it's kind of a safe zone that parents, and we, as I say, we only launched two years ago, coming up to two years ago, but we have found that one of the biggest um, attractions for it from a parents who control the remotes perspective is the fact that, that it is a commercial free zone and they, that would be big for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just going to lead on to that question because, I, you know, I think one of the challenges that Ireland faces and always has is that uh, it's a small enough country right next to a very large English-speaking country and there's always been bleed over the other countries, so you have to find ways to com compete with your, your colleagues here at, 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 the, at the table, right? So that's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, Pauline, you mentioned earlier that um, uh, you're also programming to teens maybe up to 18 years of age and I know not yeah. really in the animation space but that's a that's a challenging yeah. demo. Uh, it is and before my time in animation uh, there there were a couple of projects like Teenology which some of the guys Teenology and the variety show which were specifically uh, there were shorts one minute shorts or 90 second shorts that were put out as part of our teen block um, and it is a challenging area um, and it's I suppose animation wise it's not an, a priority area for us at the moment because we have a whole preschool channel to fill 
But um, yeah, we, we, we do through live action. And I mean, Roy is seven to 11, seven to 12 as well. It's not preschool. Um, you know, we also collaborate with CBBC on a project called Brain Freeze, um, which is seven to 11, seven to 12, which started out, uh, it was pitched to us by a live action producer. We'd advertised for a short insert strand for our live action daily entertainment show. And a live action producer approached us with a project called Science Fiction, which was um, 10 by, I think there were four minute, uh, science based comedy shows, and it was puppet animation hybrid. And uh, we went with it, and it was very successful. We commissioned a second series, and in the third series, CBBC came on board, which allowed the producers to just grow the grow the project and uh, and and just um, improve it. So from that grew uh, the series Brain Freeze that we're just in going into production on the second series of with uh, Kite Entertainment. It's actually nominated for two awards this evening. And the real and that's very much seven to elevens and it's science based. But the real attraction for that is that it is pure comedy. I mean there's science at the core of it. But it is very funny, and uh, our seven to elevens have absolutely mopped it up. They love it. They, mm -hmm. It's one of the strongest. Um, it's one of the strongest strands within our yeah. elevator. So, Sarah, I mean, do you see that as a kind of you know you can naturally collaborate with the likes of RT because you're both public broadcasters with. Uh, similar aims and goals? I know you don't really work generally in the same age group, but it's, it's a fit, is it? I think sensible content providers, I'm not going to say a broadcaster, are looking to work with like-minded partners of all types everywhere in the world, internationally and domestically. And I think it makes absolute sense that we work more closely. We're also working across another project that's a pre-bought animation. I mean, I'd also like to say, just thinking about it now, about this older space where we are also looking as well, that, again, the ease and availability of content that this generation has that maybe we didn't... Well, every kid I know is now watching Archer. Uh, then there's Bob's, Bob's Burgers. And there's a whole new generation of things basically generated by Cartoon Network in the States that our audience is, is competing for their time as well. So I think we might be able to make some logical moves and it won't be in terms of the content, because obviously there are adult themes in some of those, but that we might pick up some of the tropes, which I can really see influencing the way we construct shows like Danger Mouse now, that we've got from Family Guy, which again is rather shockingly one of an eight-year-old boy's favorite shows. And the, the pace of the gags, the type of the gags, the way they're willing to burn through script, story, and everything, and just keep going relentlessly. That's what our audience expects. So I think we'll see some bleed over there mm -hmm. and yeah, that's we a never, good thing we never put a, a teletoon we didn't you know publish our our, our, our ratings of children watching adult content because teletoon did run adult content mm -hmm. after nine o'clock but i can tell you a lot of eight-year-olds were watching futurama family guy american dad etc yeah mm -hmm. i mean you can't sell it I did, when i started in children's i did a, a bit of a research thing into what kids appetite was for what, what they were watching what, what their favorite shows were and it was uh, Podge and Raj, it was <laughs> Catherine Lynch, it was all the stuff you think that kids mm -hmm. are not watching telly when it's on. It's, it, yeah. it, uh, well, it also speaks to what Tim said earlier about uh, wanting to do what their big brother's doing as well. Yeah. I think, you know, it's always watching up. Mm -hmm. um, just moving on from, from um, demos, uh, I just wanted to talk, because a, a number of producers here who specialize in, in, in different uh, types of animation, um, and I'm just wondering if, if you have any particular, you know, are, are you focused on 3D, 2D? Does it matter? You've got a hybrid show uh, coming up, I think. Um, uh, or sorry, no, you have a hybrid show on right now yeah. with, uh, with Jam, right? So uh, are you, do you care much about the, the format itself, Tim? No, not at all. Um, I, I think that entertainment is entertainment. I think good quality animation is good, oh, that sounds wrong, it's, it's good quality in itself, it, speak, it, speaks, it speaks volumes. What I do, um, what we do talk about internally is the fact that does something have to be CG, so dumbly, you know, does something have to be you know, 2D or whatever it is. There are, there, are, there are certain feelings around certain types that might not, not be as positive as others, but for me, um, we've all seen in every type of animation great success on each genre. It tends to be about the quality and the effort that's been put into it, 
there are certain styles that you can actually see the cracks a bit more than others. Um, and I think with CG to a degree, it has aged. So CG of a few years ago, it dates quite quickly. Mm -hmm. But then if you cast your mind back to 2D and the, and the stuff that was being created in the, in the 50s, let's say, um, you know, that, that really still holds true in so many ways because it is made in, with such passion and beauty and vigour, rigour in terms of what you expect, but also you've got your music score and then your, which, which I think, you know, it's like the Tom and Jerry's of this world when the music was created so beautifully around it, and then the storytelling, uh, certainly non-narrative. So, Long way of saying no. Story is king. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's uh, like just when when you were asking the questions before this session, I kind of had a look back at what at what the successes were, and they crossed all of the different um, um, formats. And it really does come down to story. So what we we don't look for a you know we don't look for two D or stop motion or whatever particularly. We just look for something that has. Well, in our case, we look for something that has something extraordinary, and it doesn't have to be, you know, Irish or, you know, uh, local. I mean, it, 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 you know, to have an Irish voice in the cast is something that is enough for us. But actually, what we're looking for is something that's different. Like, for example, Punky brought something completely new to the table. I mean, it was the first show ever that featured a girl with Down syndrome as the central character, where. Um, talking with a company at the moment who are developing a beautiful project which has a child with autism at the centre of the project. Um, you know, the, the Nellie and Nora is, uh, is about the weather and who'd have thought, um, and who'd have thought that an international um, audience would have such an appetite for what we thought was our own obsession. Um, but it turns out that everybody's obsessed with the weather. I thought the Irish were obsessed with the weather until they moved to Canada and then <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, so good uh, I mean beautiful stories uh, are at the centre of it. Sarah, I'll just vary it a bit before you answer, but uh, thinking of, of Roy, traditionally animation struggles sometimes to find a girl audience uh, by doing a hybrid show like Roy. It does, do you find more girls are coming to the table there? Yes. Sorry, I'd prepared an answer which I might give anyway, because of which I've been course, thinking about, which is just this was the minute for me to say that for the older audience, we aren't fussy about how it's delivered, what which type of animation. But what we really want to see is ideas that don't talk down to children. We've tried very hard in the scripted part of... CBBC, which is my own little kingdom, to push everything so that you would watch it yourself. And if you wouldn't watch it, don't expect other expect children to watch it. That you could expect to see it at eight o'clock in the evening, albeit in terms of appropriate content. So that's the thing, that's the key, don't talk down. So that's what I'm looking for. As far as keeping girls, all of this ties into the very a much larger discussion about women writing comedy, women in comedy, I believe. So I just think we need, all need to work a bit harder to find creatives who could tell stories in different ways because I don't notice that girls got tired of Powerpuff Girls, for instance, whereas they probably do get... They grow out of very quickly think mm -hmm. unicorns with glittery manes and mm -hmm. long eyelashes and fairies and all of the stuff that seems to be coming in from across Europe. So again, just because it's not known to have worked doesn't mean to say it won't, and it doesn't mean we should stop looking and trying. Uh, and that involves courage and different voices. There's certainly an argument that says that the girls have moved on to more realistic storytelling very early on, that they're the ones that will have jumped across to soaps, to things that really feel like they hold a mirror up to their lives rather than obviously something a bit more fantasy-based like animation. So if you can marry the two up, which I see no reason for, then you are going to keep the girls for longer because they'll be looking at the recognisable qualities. Sarah's looking for a soap opera with unicorns, so uh, just to <laughs> have a think about that. Um, sticking with you, Sarah, um, earlier in, on the publishing panel, Helen McAleer was talking about you know, some of the challenges of uh, rebuilding or rebooting a, a very well-known brand. I had some experience with it on a, Inspector Gadget, and, and you're experiencing it with Danger Mouse. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about your experiences with bringing okay. Danger Mouse back. I'd already brought back a much-loved 
classic to the screen in the form of Willow the Wisp for Disney a few years ago when I was at Elephant. And you learn a lot of things very quick, quickly, which is basically if you're making it for children, they don't care because they haven't seen it before. And if we go back to the non-pluralistic world when these things existed the first time around, when there were just the two channels or three channels, and children didn't have much choice, so we're kind of a captive audience, we can't expect that loyalty and those catch points to be the same. So what you've got to do, really, first and foremost, is approach it like any piece of development and make the very, very, very best show that you can from scratch. So I suspect your question is, why do it then? Well, that comes down to the, the default evil commercial side of things, which is always easier to get people to help you fund something if they think they can see the track record that's gone before. So the Delicate Balancing Act is to try and and play that out so that people can have some comfort in thinking, well, this sold to 120 territories and did this amount of millions of pairs of pants the last time it was out, to the, well, what am I going to do to make it feel fresh and unique uh, for a new audience, which has a wide variety of choice. And with something like Danger Mouse, we really deconstructed it. I mean, really deconstructed it. We had to be really quite brave. And ultimately, what it came down to for us was it's about friendship. It's actually a very... It's a heart-driven show. It's about the love that those two characters have for each other. And then we built back up from there. Each of these classics is different and has a different starting point. And it's probably different, again, if you're working in preschool because then you are probably going on parents' nostalgia because they do tend to control what their kids are watching in a way that the older kids absolutely won't allow. Mm -hmm. Did that make sense? Perfect. Did that make sense, sense kids? Yeah, did. I, I'm going to jump along because, again, I'm conscious of time, and we've got a, a pretty young audience here generally, and um, I know a lot of them would like to know, you know, how do you get to meet people such as yourselves. I mean, there's events like this and everybody's talked about uh, the value of coming to stuff like this and I would definitely encourage you to, to ask questions because this is quite a privilege to have a, a panel like this in front of you. So, uh, Tim, you know, how, how approachable are you? <laughs> no, it's a really good question though, I think. It's, I am very approachable. It's, I've just got a very, very good PA who basically manages my diary and keeps keeps it tight. So my typical day kicks off at, um, so kicks off at, I suppose, 8.30, that's 8.30, and I leave usually around quarter to seven at night. It's mainly, uh, my day is basically meetings, usually internal meetings, um, which, um, which, you know, that's the way it plays. But those internal meetings tend not to be about meeting and greeting, you know, new people with great ideas. I do have a, uh, I do have a department, and I do have a, a for a small team of people who are looking about at any one moment, they have about 150 ideas on at any one time that they, that they go through. And the, the, the bits that they, the content that they like gets put on my desk and then we can have decisions around do we actually see them or not and so on and so forth. In terms of how to get to see me, because I do think that great ideas and uh, are the lifeblood of this, um, it is going to be events like this. It is networking. I was talking to a few of you just before this session. It's about being really clear, if someone, a lot of people say to me, Tim, can I have a job in TV as opposed to can you commission my show? But it's being really, really clear about what you want to see me about. That's one thing. The other thing is use these events well. If you do, don't be scared of coming up and talking um, you know, to me or to my colleagues. It, you know, we're, not, we're not scary. Um, but also be really clear about the fact that just because you can't see me for the first time, do try again. It's not a you know, it's, it is one of those things, and there will be on occasions where you think no one's talking to me and no one's listening and so on, but just keep on. The, the other thing is, it was mentioned, the CMC, um, so the Children's Media Conference over in Sheffield, and then a bit like this, and someone mentioned about even, you know, the, the colleges getting you to, to can for it. You know, whatever, I know it's, it's expensive and, and, and so on, but any, anything like that is really useful. So in terms of getting to see me, um, it is, um, it is certainly tr getting in touch. Um, I will then tend to, so if someone says to me, I've got a, a great idea and I don't know who they are, I tend to then put them in touch with my department to actually either see you or whatever. And then it's about convincing them that you should take it up the line. It is, it, it is, it is tough. We don't, we did, none of us now have, have loads of people uh, working for us. It is very much uh, 
everyone seems to be just doing more with less, but they're expected to do it better. It's about, and so it's about being really focused and being really tenacious and not giving up. Um, uh, so, and you get see fantastic. I'm very, very happy to see you if I can. But it's, a, it's I don't know if, if this is really true. It's just the first one in my world. It's, it's difficult. However, coming to that, I will open it up there. I do the networking thing is really important. The relationships that I have with many of you in this room, it's really important because those guys have guys and women have my number, my phone, my, my mobile number. And anyone who gets my mobile number can track me down far more easily, uh, and I'll, I'll respond if I recognise the number. The face comes up, and I recognise who they are. They're not, and that is where the relationship com comes in. That is where building and spending time, nurturing. I'm in town, fancy it, you know? Can we meet up for ten minutes, have a cup of coffee, or a glass of wine, and so on? And that is, that is how those relationships are built. And certainly for those guys and uh, girls who I have commissioned to work with, you have that that relationships even more so. So it always starts off with something like this, and then it builds. So it's about putting effort into the relationship, I think, that's from my point of view. Yeah, animated series take an awfully long time to make, and uh, you really want to be working with people you like. So Pauline, uh, do, uh, do I like any of them? Do you like any of the people you work with? <laughs> <laughs> do you have uh, all their mobile numbers? I would numbers? say, uh, same as Tim, except I don't have a department or a team. So, um, uh, in reality, I mean, I, I mean, when I say same as Tim, you know, these kind of events, um, you know, I would try and kind of get involved in things like Fresh Film Festival and, you know, and different things we're asked to come along to, um, to take part in and speak at. There are good opportunities to, to meet up and just have a chat with people. Um, but I don't know whether it's worth exploring, but I would be open to or happy to kind of, if the colleges wanted to look at maybe setting up a kind of, you know, whatever session, uh, I would be happy, happy to, to facilitate that. Basically, my time is, is taken with, uh, I mean, I, I, I literally, it is just me. Um, I manage all of the live action and, uh, and animation content for all of RTE young people. So that kind of it runs from kind of meeting people with ideas and meeting the guys and, uh, and the productions that are kind of, you know, in development or that are in production and viewings and scripts and the whole lot of it. So in reality, kind of saying that I will make myself available to meet people one to one, it's probably not going to be possible, but I would be very happy to, um, to you know, to have a regular annual kind of um, meet up with each of the colleges if that was of use um, to to the colleges. Sounds like the heads of departments should be giving Polly and a call to, to set this up, oh, and I think that's a great idea as well. Like, to, uh, yeah, I mean, and in terms yeah. of the non-students, obviously, kind of for the you know the production companies who are up and running, but we haven't actually collaborated with. I mean, when people send in ideas or look to meet, I will always try and meet everybody about their idea at least once and see where it goes from there. And you know, I mean. The, the reality is that, you know, uh, somebody said at a session I was at yesterday, we need good content. Like, we are really, you know, we, we, you, what you make is what actually feeds our channels. So it's really important for us to kind of, you know, to, to, to have good stuff, uh, good ideas coming in and to engage with them. So, uh, yeah, so. Great. And Sarah, how does the BBC interface with emerging talent? Okay, so obviously, one of the most established and potentially successful ways of doing it is for you to hook up with a studio, the likes of which the producers you saw on the last panel, because they've already got a relationship with us. So that's one way of doing it. But for example, Strange Hill High came from the mind of a very unique individual. Uh, and in fact, the DVD got put through my letterbox in my first week at the BBC and the dog took it out in the garden and sort of chewed it a bit and ran around with it so we're lucky that Stranger Eye exists at all but we are quite uniquely positioned in that every now and again maybe once a year we will pick up something that feels very special and different and fresh that has a real strength of vision and an altered feel we equally don't have anybody but providing you bear with us we will go through everything it gets logged and we will review it in the small team of three that there are of us. And we all look at everything and then we'll get back with it to you with some useful feedback. And if you want to take cards from me at the end, then I'll promise that at some stage in the next few months, we, we will take a look. 
uh, and that's how we work it. I think we've had to work it like that because as public service, everybody should be allowed to at least show us things even if they're not right or they're not for us or the understanding isn't correct. And then if we do take your idea on, then we kind of work with you on it in-house. We will help engage the studio and we will certainly be responsible for part of the funding ourselves and raising the rest of funding through a network of people that we like to work with around the world. Can I, can I also just say that in terms of policy, because um, that question was really about are you going to be able to see me, in terms of policy, anything that comes through to us, we will review, but it takes it takes a few months. Yeah, um, and likewise, uh, and, uh, we and that's, uh, yeah, and that's policy. But yeah. it, that three months is like an age for anyone. You know, it's kind of really quite tumbleweedy. Kind of, are they are they doing anything? But there is. Always but the commissioning a, process, I'm sure you have an e-commissioning type thing like we do. You can anyone can register on e-commissioning and submit an idea, and there is a commitment from RTE that. Uh, you'll get an initial response within two weeks. Two um, weeks. Yeah, that's the initial response. Okay. Um, but the reality is that uh, you know, if we are interested, I mean, we will say no to stuff or instantly not kind of that isn't for us. But but the reality is with animation, unlike uh, live action, that you know, there's so many different kind of thing ducks to line up, and there's so many stages that e-commissioning is probably i mean what the the um, established studios will probably tell you is that e-commissioning is almost the last place that something gets pitched in because it the ideas uh, do come to us through meetings and through pitches mm -hmm. yeah. um, so can i i'm going to chuck a couple of things in the first is uh, for those of you that know, e-commissioning at the BBC has gone a tiny bit wrong and is now called pitch. So therefore, I would suggest that you email me directly because we don't understand how it works yet. <laughs> uh, uh, nobody does. And you certainly need to have been invited and we don't know how to invite people. So don't do that. The other thing is I think we haven't talked about here and it's really, really important. No matter how great your idea is and how brilliant you think it is, it's probably worth a good look round at what else we all have on our channels. Uh, we've all got great websites with commissioning pages that will probably tell you what we're looking for because there's absolutely no prob point in bringing me another superhero, secret agent mouse, or Tim, another sponge text character, anything based under the sea. So Except for Tim, anything based under the sea. Anything based under the sea. <laughs> so I always think it's worth doing a little bit of research and that will always endear you to every broadcaster if you could say in your covering email i thought this would sit nicely with this because i know you have it or not picture something we've already got makes it feel like you've really thought about how we might do our job and how it might work and that was one of the first bits of advice i was given when i came over to this side of the business and that's the bit that i think holds most true do your research before you submit anything and disappointment will then be avoided good advice um really quickly um uh, you know, I think a question that often comes up is how much stuff do people need to bring in? You know, what, 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 what constitutes enough for you to say, okay, let's look at this a little more as a package, Tim? Depends. Um, I have been pitched a sentence which we've fallen in love with and we take it on to the next thing. Or if we are at a stage where I share it with my international colleagues, I'm part of a, something called the IPC, which is the International Programming Council. It sounds pretty grand, but ultimately every Tuesday at lunchtime we get on a conference call and we discuss um, the latest and greatest uh, ideas and we then figure out who in the international community actually likes them. Then we, it's best to have a Bible, ideally a trailer, a script or two and I was, you know, I, this morning I was talking um, to an indie about, um, you know, the ideal of pitching, let's say, in a sentence, but also creating something that can be watched within 30 seconds, a minute, and the idea then is fully delivered. I get given a lot of stuff when I know that the executives involved who need to really digest this stuff, they are also time, you know, time strapped. So the idea is to, yes, provide stuff, but make sure it's succinct. Mm -hmm. and make sure that if there's any chance of confusion, take it out. You really kind of laser sharp in terms of what you want the message to be and it makes it much easier. Polly? Um, same, I mean, most projects that um, I would be pitched would be, um, wouldn't have a trailer made at, that's at the initial stages. I mean, um, 
usually on a first pitch there would be some character designs and some world designs, a kind of a, a Bible, not necessarily the full fleshed out Bible. Um, but, uh, um, and oftentimes uh, there wouldn't be a script available yet, but I suppose enough to spark an initial interest and a kind of a curiosity to see what a script looks like. So um, a Bible would be, would be usually what we'd look at first. And Sarah? Uh, the easy answer is whatever you think will best communicate what your vision and ambition is for the project. So that could be any one of a number of things. As an ex-producer, I always fall a little tiny bit short of asking people for animation because I know how expensive it is. And I think we should be able to at least visualise what you're getting. So the, thing, the key thing for the BBC, which is different from the others, is you won't get very far without a script that you feel is definitive. And some of that is down to the fact that our controller, our current controller, Cheryl, is the ex-head of BBC Comedy. So she's worked with everybody in the past, and scripts is the way she's used to looking at things. So we're going to sell something into her, because we all have 1,000, 1,500 submissions a year, of which we'll maybe take 12 to 20 over the course of the year up to the controller to see what we'll do with them. It's the script you'll ask for. So maybe the halfway house, a useful halfway house, so you can kind of get an idea of the rhythm and the sense of it is a good animatic, quite a polished animatic, might be something. Great. And before we go uh, to uh, questions and answers, just a really simple one. Um, what, what show do you wish you had that you don't? Tim? I always used to say Spongebob. So. No, it would be probably, it would be one of the, one of the Turner Cartoon Network shows um, that has done so very well, annoyingly. Um, and either of those, you know, the Adventure Time. Adventure Time. Yeah, would, yeah. Be, would be fantastic to have on, on the slate. Be, but, but I know the time's short, but be, it's amazing. Uh, we talked earlier about the fact that you need to give time for brands to grow. And this is a classic example of where you had you know, three, three brands that were allowed to get on with it. There was no kind of panic. It was, and it was because there, there were the reasons for it, but they were allowed to develop and grow. And they were quite out there in many ways, but, and they didn't do very well to begin with, but they just suddenly started getting traction, started coming, having a bit of playground currency, talkability, and because it wasn't necessarily something that adults would watch, it suddenly became great in the kids' domain. So mm -hmm. suddenly you have a hit on your hands, and they've been riding high now for a good two years on that, and, uh, uh, and it, that's, that's really Yeah, hit, hits often take risks, I think. Sarah? I'm tempted to say Scooby-Doo, but we actually do have it on. It's a bit <laughs> naughty. Um, I think it's an example of, of some of the reboots don't work quite as well, and it being a brand in search of a bit of love, so I'd love the opportunity to take it somewhere else. Uh, I'm going to say regular show because I prefer it to Adventure Time. I think the characters are great. I think it's got long-running sitcom potential that it's in the Simpsons vein, and I just think it's genius. Very funny. Um, Pauline, do you want a Cartoon Network show as well? Uh, um, well, I suppose because we have 61% acquisitions, we pretty much have uh, um, a lot of the shows on the channel that we don't own, but they're there for us. So, I mean, I actually don't... I wasn't expecting that question, so I don't have one. But what I was going to say is that we are working with um, CBBC on uh, another um, uh, animation project called Zig and Zag, which you're probably all too young to remember Zig and Zag, are you? No. <laughs> no, but it, uh, it, it's been, Ronan McCabe, the producer, has been trying to get this project over the line for a long time, and while it's not a reboot, it is uh, a reimagining of a very, very, very fond uh, pair of Irish puppets. And, very uh, funny we're puppets, forward. yes. Very funny puppets. Hodge and Raj people too, as well, right? Mm, Related, no? Brother, they are the same yeah, people, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, thanks so much, and, uh, and I think we, we, we've got a lot to download, but um, before we depart for the day, I'd just like to open it up to the floor, and I have the microphone. That's my Okay, that's an interesting one, um, and I think that's not anything conscious, that's just the kind of content that gets offered. I would argue that it's not entirely true that Scream Street seems to me to have 
uh, a really wide sweep, representative sh sweep, deliberately, of different kinds of characters where all of our audience will be able to recognise something of themselves in the young cast, albeit they're werewolves, vampires, mummies, zombies, the whole paranormal world. Uh, there's certainly space at CBBC for telling different stories about different types of kids. Uh, and as we move on, you'll see more of it. We had a fabulous show in development that they just couldn't get their funding for, which very much played into that not typical hand-on-hips boy, wannabe superhero mould, but they couldn't get their funding. So I'm going to say to you, the BBC had done put their offer in. It's not really us, it might be the might be other territories that don't like that kind of thing, so it's less easy to fund the less obvious show. Um, <laughs> Jump in. Done. Well, I was just going to say, a project that we're collaborating on, uh, The Day Henry Met, has very much the kind of, the, uh, the, uh, the softer boy at the centre of it. Um, but it was just something Sarah reminded me of earlier, which is diversity and the importance for it. And, um, you know, in, well, certainly in our, our live action and our in-house production, we work very hard to try and make sure that we reflect the diversity of society and multicultural Ireland that's kind of, uh, that's with us now. And I think it's really important to do that in animation too and to, to uh, yeah, just to, to reflect all of the children's experience and worlds. And there's another very nice project that Gary mentioned earlier, um, Kiva, which has um, just that at the centre. So, happy days. Tim, anything to add? Only in terms of the live action space, there's quite a, it's quite broad. And whether or not you think about the iCarly's and Victoria's and so on, um, there's quite a lot of... Uh, it, the, the, the characterizations are diverse, certainly. In terms of animation, it's an interesting one. I do think that there are there is more diversity. If you really sort of break it down, you sort of have a look, you'll find that there's quite a lot of examples um, of, of, of a range of diversity. Preschool, yes, that, that's by nature of what it is. It tends to be a little bit softer. Um, but in the other, in the animation space for the older kids, for our Nicktoons, it's quite interesting. I'm not going to go to another subject, but it's quite interesting that the the action orientated animation is being viewed by younger and younger kids, usually boys, and that is because com computer games in themselves have created a passive scenario, which is the viewing, into an active scenario, which is, right, you know what, certainly, well, we can do our own killing now. We are in control of what we want to do, and that has really meant that the, a lot of the action stuff has driven younger. Uh, in terms of having softer characters though coming through, that does come from humour, and humour transcends gender, so uh, that is certainly our space presently. Any other questions? The back there. Yeah, there is. Uh, I mean, I mentioned science fiction. It started out as a strand within Elevate, which is our, our daily entertainment show, which was well, just finished. But um, and we, I mean, obviously we need to kind of look at our, our kind of our budget and prioritize, and we have a kind of a, a need to create a certain amount of content. But there is always space for testing characters or testing. Um, testing ideas uh, yeah, uh, through, because all of our programs um, have active websites. So, I mean, that can be a good space for, uh, for trying out stuff. I'm also involved in the Frameworks project that um, RTE and the Film Board fund. So, um, I mean, that's also a, uh, well, it's, it's great because I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of it, but it's a funding scheme where we fund three to four sometimes five short, six minute animated shorts um, in a year. And sometimes they come from established producers and studios, and sometimes they come from 
um, people just coming, coming through. So that's certainly something that's worth having a look at. Um, but, you know, I mean, I suppose funding, permit, permitting, um, yes. We have a, we have a short form program, um, which is, um, which is, and I, I didn't mention it earlier, and I should have, um, the, every year we have a live, a live action and also a preschool stroke animation short form opportunity where anyone can actually put a short form film um, into the mix. You have to sort of, it's an entry thing, it's a competition, um, and the best are, are picked from the crop. We then can actually take those and we will put them on our, on our uh, app, the Nickelodeon app that we have. It's fairly, it's fairly new and embryonic in terms of how this is, how the States did it for a while and we've taken it on. I think it's a fantastic initiative. It really does then open the, open the, uh, the, the opportunities to all. And I think that's a very, very important way of doing it. So um, I will make sure that everyone is aware of the short form uh, Nickelodeon program. If you see me later on, I'll make sure that you know what site to actually go on and check it out. But yeah, it's, that's a good opportunity. So to your point, yes, there is opportunity. And because we are now looking at all sorts of ways to, of delivering shows, i.e. an app or online or whatever, there's a lot more opportunity than ever before. Very quickly, in terms of linear, you will find ourselves, certainly as a commercial person, I want to understand how, if I pay for a short form film, depending on how long that short form might be, how often can I repeat it, um, and so on and so forth. We do have a couple, Lost and Found and Ruffalo, we have, you, you know, that, 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 but they are very rare. We do have, um, but we do use on occasion film, so let's say, call it a commercial 40 minutes, which isn't really a film length, but it, let's call it film for sake of argument that then lends itself to understanding whether something has legs or not, or we use it to launch something. So there are, and that's not short form, so to speak. I should have mentioned that Peckles came from the framework scheme. Um, it started out as a six minute uh, framework short called Fear of Flying, beautiful short, and is finding new life. Yeah, Android. Android, badly mm -hmm. drawn wrong, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we would approach it slightly differently and I think the opportunities for short form are probably tied to one of big events that you want to celebrate in a special way. Some of you may or may not have seen the spectacular piece that Jackie Edwards produced for Armistice Day this year, which was played at 11 o'clock for the two minutes silence, which was just beautiful and she put that together. So we would be looking either to acquire or work through with you to support things like the centenary of World War I, big one-off events that absolutely celebrate something special rather than things like Halloween and Christmas. And I think that's an interesting creative driver. And if there's anything coming up, that you think you're interested in in the next couple of years, that would be the kind of thing we're looking at. A one-off piece of brilliance. A good way to finish, I think. Um, uh, we're out of time, folks, but I think that was a really great session with lots of useful information, so I'd just like to thank our panellists, Tim, Pauline, and Sarah. <laughs>